everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Cat Chat with Keeper Bridget and Gift Shop Andy. Hey, guys. So today we have something pretty special going on. Um, a little away from big cats, though. Today we decided, um, actually long ago, weeks ago, we had this planned out. Uh, we decided to go on more of an educational perspective for small cats. Domestic cats. Yeah. Um, you know, we really don't talk about We talk about small cats all the time, but we don't talk about it from the perspective of you know, what happens to the feral ones or what happens to, you know, how do you come by the ones that you have, right? Or, and, and we don't really ever talk about the shelters. And, you know, even though we do big cats all the time, big cats aren't the, aren't the only cat around. Yeah, it's true. It's true. So we're going to introduce you to uh, one of our good friends. Um, her name is Megan. She works in the shelter facility here where Andy and I are foster parents. Um, and so she's going to give us some really great information today about domestics and how we can help um, take care of them in both our home environments and also out in our feral cat communities so we hope you enjoy this podcast and uh, we'll catch up with you guys at the very end see you in a little bit see you in a second all right everybody welcome back to another episode of cat chat with bridget and andy we hey are joined today by actually one of our friends one of our good friends uh megan elaine Alan, Alan, Elaine, Alan. Alan. Wow, you really set that one up. I really it's, wanted to. Hey. I want it to be fancy. I don't know why. I want because because well, you're British and I want you to be fancy all the time. Even your name. I just I'm like I just want you to always be fancy. Please meet one of our good friends. What's your last name? <laughs> I don't call her by her full name when I see her. I'm just like, hey, it's my friend Megan. Okay, um, Donnie, whatever. <laughs> Just gonna, just gonna drink my tea here now. Um, as you guys can tell uh, from watching this, it is cold here in Florida. Now, uh, Megan has only been here for about a year and a half. She moved, you moved from the Northwest. Um, I did, I did. I moved from um, Seattle-ish area, um, which was cold all the time. So that was fine. Um, but originally I am from the UK. So that is very nice. This is still hot for me. I'm, I'm very happy with this. Um, chilly weather <laughs> <laughs> and you can see that i've acclimated to florida for quite some time now so i'm like hat sweatshirt the whole nine yeah um, you you opened the back door this morning and i immediately shut it yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was 50 degrees i also just burned my i also just burned my tongue on my tea so that's gonna be fun for this podcast um anyway so let's kind of get into it and um get this party started so Megan, just if you want, wouldn't mind, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into animal welfare. Yeah, sure. So um, as you guys can tell by the accent, and, and Bridget mentioned, I'm from the UK originally. Um, and animal welfare in the UK is very different to what we have here in the US. Um, it's actually a lot more lower key. And there really isn't as prominent as it is here in the US, um, which probably speaks really well to how good our spade neuter systems are over there and how long we've been doing that sort of stuff over there, which is awesome. Um, so when I first got involved with animal welfare, it was in a very, very small shelter. Um, it was it was a townhouse, a three story townhouse that somebody had converted into a cat shelter. And that's kind of how I first got started. I was a volunteer. I did adoptions for them and I became a foster parent and I loved it. Um, and when I moved over here to the US, up to Seattle, uh, I ended up being able to get a job. Um, I started a frontline at an animal shelter, uh, cleaning kennels and doing adoptions and, and doing all that really, really fun stuff. And then moved up into fostering, uh, became the foster coordinator up there. And then moved down here to sunny Florida, not that cold, and uh, was able to be a foster coordinator down here. Um, I've moved a little bit on from that recently. And now I'm working more with community programs within our, our area. Nice. nice nice so would it be safe to say that there's a different first and foremost there's a different thought process regarding shelters in the UK but also because it's such a smaller country that there are fewer cats that need rescuing or is that is there a correlation between those things 
yeah I would say there probably is um obviously much much smaller country I mean it's 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 smaller than Florida as a whole so you know we're, we're talking a, a much smaller land mass um and therefore the shelters are slightly ne necessary um the cats that are outdoors there tend to stay closer to the city centers um but generally we just have a much smaller kitten population people are much more on top of getting that that access to spay neuter and i i actually feel like access to veterinary care is probably slightly more affordable there as well so it becomes more the norm to get your cat spayed and neutered kind of immediately um, and i think that's really been a big help in moving that forward and getting comfortable with that um but yeah it's definitely a different different energy around animal welfare our biggest shelter there is, is probably smaller than the shelter i work at now so and and mine isn't even the biggest one in florida so uh, yeah it's a very different kind of you know space um yeah yeah very different okay there's a cat in the background drinking some water off of a uh... yeah that would be wonder that um once my time was where i kept my glass of water and now it is her glass of water so that's how it goes with cats yeah we yeah, yeah. that's why you can't have nice things <laughs> in fact all three of them have joined me now so oh good well we'll hope to see them later on later on yeah. in the uh, in the in the podcast so do you want to take the next question or do you want to no and you know what i'll let you keep going with this because okay. this is a kind of a big topic at least i mean it's a big topic for all three of us but you've been involved with uh with this for a while as you know you and megan so yeah um i'll chime in as color commentary on this one i but classic i'm classic. going to get a sweatshirt because I'm freezing <clears throat> because somebody opened up all the windows. Not in this room. No, not in this room. I'll be right. right back. Go ahead. All right. Go. So, um, so obviously a lot of these questions. Oh, hi. I know the answer <laughs> to, um, but, uh, but for our viewers and our listeners, what is your current position with the SPCA? Sure. So I'm currently with SPCA Florida, which is a mid-sized shelter here in central Florida. We're right in between um, Tampa and Orlando, actually pretty close to Bridget and Andy, evidently how we're friends. Um, so right now I've just taken on a new program. We're actually building a, a bigger and better program, which is going to serve our community with low cost spay and neuter, um, especially for people who may not be able to afford that. And then really heavily start working some more in TNR. Um, TNR or TMVR, uh, standing for trap new to return or trap new to vaccinate return. It's the same process. The vaccinate is just something that occasionally we add the, the V in there. So if you hear TNR or TMVR, it's interchangeable. Most places do vaccinate at the same time, and that's really important too. Um, so that's really talking about trapping outdoor community cats, stray cats, feral cats, however you'd like to refer to them, and making sure that they can no longer make more cats and then popping them back to where they came from. Um, we're going to be really ramping up that program. Uh, they were pretty robust really before the pandemic and the unfortunate you know side effect of the pandemic that really impacted animal welfare was our access to veterinary resources um a lot of what we needed to do spay and neuter is also what hospitals need not the literal things but your gloves your masks your gowns all those sort of items and they're in such short supply that the the major organizations that are here within the u.s really shut down spay and neuter everywhere and that massively impacted what we were doing with tnr and what we were doing with outdoor and community cats. Um, so for a year and a half almost, these cats were just out there, not knowing there's a pandemic and continuing to make more cats. Um, so <laughs> it's definitely gonna be um, a big undertaking to try and get back to even where we were and then keep moving forward from that too. Ooh, yeah, that's definitely gonna be a big, big hurdle to climb over. But I, out of anybody I have ever met, I know that you are the one who will be able to manage all of that because you have like this, you know, undetermined personality and you're like, I'm going to get this done. Let's do this. Are so we're going for determined. What did I say? De you said undetermined. I did. Yeah. Oh, I meant determined. Sorry. I still have, this is like my first, this is my first <clears throat> cup of tea. It's, and I haven't had much of it. So we're not even drinking yet. We're, we all have fairly determined personalities. You should drink your tea. I'm working on it. It's very hot. <laughs> um, but just in case, uh, just in case people don't know, could you explain what TNR or TNVR stands for, please? Absolutely. So it's trap, neuter, and then either vaccinate, return or trap, neuter, return. 
the vaccinate refers to both rabies and FERTP vaccines. And this is strictly cats. I know we're, we're a cat conversation today, but this is strictly related to cats. We do not do this with dogs, um, mostly because generally stray dogs are picked up and taken into the shelter. There's very few outdoor colonies of dogs. And um, so this really, really does relate to cats um, solely. Um, and it's the process of, I say, trapping a, a cat or kitten outside a kitten that would not want to be inside or a cat that would not want to be inside, taking them into a shelter for a spay or neuter procedure, neuter spay kind of used interchangeably there, whether they're male or female. Um, and they get their shots at that point too. So they're going to get their FBRCP, that's that broad spectrum um, kind of protection virus that your own cats would get, and their rabies vaccine as well and then putting them back to where they came from. And the return is really kind of the important part with that as well. And um, for a long time, people would say release, um, trap new to release, which implies that you can pick a cat up, take it anywhere and put it down and it'll be fine. Um, it's really important to return your cats to their home. Um, whilst we may not recognize it as a home, it is home to them. We're taking them from their area and we need to make sure we're putting them back there too. That's definitely something that um, we have a lot of experience with at Big Cat Rescue too, because when it comes to um, rehabilitating native wild Florida bobcats, we do return them back to the county from which they came. And that is one regulated by the FWC, but also, you know, that does make sense. You don't want to have like, you don't just want to be like, okay, we're going to release all the bobcats in Hillsborough County, all of them. And then just be like, or overrun with bobcats. And so it makes sense to kind of return them to, you know, to the place that they came from. Right. Um, and, you know, unlike kind of you guys doing this long-term rehabilitation, they're there for a long time. We're talking about 24 hours. These cats are gone from this area. You know, we're trapping them. It's probably overnight. They're going into the clinic the next day by the following one. So, okay, 36 hours, uh, they're back out and, and back out there. So, you know, if you were to trap it in a, in a, carry it, take it and put it somewhere else. It's going to have no idea where it was. All that road savviness, knowing where it gets its food, knowing, you know, you don't know if somebody's feeding this cat, you know, that all that's gone if you move them. So really important to return them back to that area. That's, um, I think that's, I think that's a really important thing to make people aware of is just, you know, that this is, you know, you can't just like be like, okay, well, I'm going to return this cat here you know, bring it back where you found it or, you know, have the, you know, have professionals handle this, but yeah. it's definitely a, a really important program. Are you, are you finding that based on your research, people are welcoming to feral cat communities or is it less well received by communities or is it different based on the locations that you've lived in? I think precisely that it is different um, and people really tend to sit either on one side or on the other. They either feel that feral cats are a part of our ecosystem and that that is normal and that they are out there and that we need to include them when we're talking about wildlife and when we're talking about, you know, our ecosystems as a whole, or they feel that they're a nuisance, that they're a pest, that they, <clears throat> excuse me, potentially are invasive. Um, and they feel that they should be eradicated. And um, what's really interesting is when you start looking into how people feel like they should be moved, um, or how people feel like they should no longer be in their area. Nobody ever wants to stand up and say, yes, I think this cat should be euthanized. Nobody wants to do that. But realistically, when you're talking about removing cats from an area, that is the only alternative. If you're saying, I want this cat gone, there really isn't another option for them other than euthanasia. So I think really as we, we look to educate more people around what the alternatives to TNR or TMBR are, you know, what our options are, it's euthanasia. And nobody wants to say, yes, I want this cat to be euthanized. So a lot of that really, you know, those opponents, we really need to educate them on his, here's the reality. Um, but there's also a lot of, you know, deterrence as well. So people think I don't want these cats around here because they're fighting because they're yowling because they are digging up in my yard there's so many simple easy ways to stop all that behavior which makes them much more easy to live with and one of the biggest ways is actually spaying and neutering them a lot of the behaviors that they complain about are the same behaviors that are part of mating their mating rituals they're calling for mates they're fighting because they're fighting over territory as soon as we take away those hormones a lot of that calms down as well I think a lot of those things can, you know, a lot of, so for a lot of our viewers or listeners, those things can be very easily translated to big cats. We've, you know, at Big Cat Rescue, we've seen these, these behaviors happen. You know, we've seen 
aggressive males that needed to be neutered. Um, we've seen, you know, cats living together that have either come together or have been put together, they get separated at feeding time because there is the aggression that goes towards, you know, food in, in the mornings when it's time to feed. So those, you know, it, it makes sense to just kind of scale it down. You know, the same patterns, behaviors, associations we all have, or this community has with tigers and bobcats can very easily be scaled down to feral domestic cats yeah, um, little baby ones yeah just you know just like the ones that run around outside which <laughs> terrifies me um but uh just in case you're overrun with them no I, i'm not scared of them i'm just scared that they're gonna get hurt that's my only concern i'm like don't hurt the cats um but you know we've you started kind of this conversation about the digging and the yards and you know what is a common belief about feral cats that's inaccurate I think I think the most common one is that they're a threat to our ecosystem. I think we, we hear that a lot um, here in Florida, especially that they're a threat, threat to native birds and that they are a threat to um, everything that's out there. I think it's one of the most common misconceptions that cats are invasive and that they and, and they've been portrayed this way in the media as well. If you look at media articles, you can find articles that really portray just little baby cats as this invasive species that's going to take over the world and whilst we know they're very adaptable and whilst we know that they're, they're very that strong, is a world I want to live in I'm just going to be yeah. honest uh, that is a world I want to live it's in it's like it's like people in the pit bull it's, oh like, yeah no I, the pit bull I have, oh. I have never met one pit bull that didn't want to attack my face with its tongue I know right and and and, and know, hurt me with its tail because it's so it's going so fast like just so happy but yeah yeah, yeah. and and I know we've had these conversations before Megan about um, you know, that the big misconception that somehow, you know, cats can fly and dive bomb and get other birds out of the air. And, you know, it's, it's, it's incorrect. It's inaccurate. It's not right. It needs to change that thought process um, is kind of dumb. Uh, but, uh, but I guess, but when that's all you've been fed by the news media or any media, you know, when that's all you've been told is that these cats are a danger to society and that they're going to ruin ecosystems and overthrow, you know, governments. Whoa, Ooh. they will. Oh uh, yeah, cats, I mean, cats, cats are with a, uh, well, Mars a pan. I'm buying your wings. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, but when that's all you've been told, that's all you know, that's all you can believe, and so that's why I wanted to ask this question I wanted to get a different narrative of you know feral cat communities or colonies and and the common misconception about them yeah absolutely and, and you're right and when I mean what article are you going to click on you're going to click on the article that says oh these cats are here they're here they're going to get everything or oh look this, this cat's outside it, it ate a mouse that's cool <laughs> Like, you know, it, it, it's clickbait media, you know, it's just, it's the That's same cool. sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, no, clickbait is, is, is prevalent and quite, quite intense sometimes. So, yeah, yeah. So realistically, when we talk about cats within our ecosystem, um, here in the US, we, we need to recognize that cats have been here since the 1600s. You know, they, they ain't new. They, they haven't just turned up. They're, they're not brand new. They, they've not emigrated anytime recently. They've always been here. And, you know, for starters, for us to think that we can control that is probably one of the most egotistical things out there. You know, when, when this is a part of it. It's been going on for hundreds of years. Like, we, we don't need to control that. But, you know, human behavior, and we think we need to control everything. So yeah. we'll, <laughs> we'll leave that one there. But uh, <laughs> they've been here for a long time. And a lot yeah, of this, this mental image of emigrating cats just like they like they're like you know they get on boats and they like come over and they're like oh where's a good place where can we where can we colonize i get I'm yeah I, 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 I could see that the the immigration officer you know dr cat whatever his name is no five you can't come into the country you know that oh i just imagine they're like there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of pipples in uh, in in Louisiana and New Orleans. We don't want to go there, guys. Just stay away from New Orleans. There's a lot of pitbulls there. We don't want to go there. Look at you, <laughs> demon pitbull. They'd be more scared of the German shepherds. But that's fine. <laughs> yes, but see, cats can also have biases as well. <laughs> okay, we digress. <laughs> yes, that's true. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, on on, on that on that topic. They, the cats have been here, you know, quite a long time, and many of them are not native to this country, but 
you know, as we know, they're not doing the damage that we've been told by, you know, governments or local governments around here and, you know, around, around the country. So I guess, I don't know, it's not really, that part is not really necessarily the problem. Is it now? Is it? No, I mean, but the cats have never been the problem. It's the humans, which is always the problem, because as Megan said, it's egotistical for us to think that we can control these animals. And, you know, the only way to control this is through TNR or TNVR mm -hmm. and to help those populations and to, you know, mitigate the overpopulation and then therefore, you know, protect the resources. Absolutely. And it's really interesting. I'm, I'm sure you guys have heard of some of these studies that, that estimate that 4 billion birds are killed by cats each. <laughs> you look at how many birds there actually are in the US, the rough estimates, obviously. If we were killing 4 billion birds a year, there wouldn't be any birds left. There'd be none. Uh, these studies are often really, really overinflating generalized populations. They're taking a small sample. They're saying, hey, here's, you know, we're going to monitor these cats. I'm going to see how many times they try and hunt. I'm going to see how many times they're going to try and do this. And then we're going to times that by 50,000, because we think that's how many there are. And these, you know, these numbers are really crazy off. And if you look at where a lot of these researchers are coming from, they're very strong bird advocates that are, a lot of these people are really highly connected within avian populations. And it's, I'm not meaning to demonize avian, you know, lovers or anything like that. I, I want everybody to coexist happily, but it, we can't fully blame cats for any form of, of you know, drop in bird numbers here. Um, they have been here for such a long time, but our giant skyscrapers haven't. And the... and our pesticides and our insecticides haven't either. You know, we are adding those things into our environments and our ecosystems, and that also has a population that also has an, an impact on the bird populations, you know, you think about you, oh, I've got a rodent problem. I'm going to use, you know, rodent killer. Well, then this bird comes and swoops in and takes this rodent that's been consuming rodent killer. And now the bird is dead, um, which has nothing to do with the cat, but. But it's easy to blame the cat because that's not something we do. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, when we look at a lot of those research, it, it, it is, massively often it's massively estimated if you if you really start digging into where those numbers come from um so a lot of the times when people are saying okay we need to eradicate cats we need to get rid of them from an area and they're using these sort of um inflated studies as their their justification and it's actually it's very hard to remove cats from an area for a start you know to know that you get them all you have to come in and take every single cat all at once and obviously we know what the outcome for those cats are or you need to poison them with a very specific poison the only times they've really effectively been able to do this has been in island populations, island controlled populations. And there's two that have been completely successful in removing what they consider to be invasive cats from the islands. They're both in like, the Australia region, one's close to New Zealand, one's Savannah, Antarctic, and they both remove cats from the ecosystem. And in both cases, they had huge explosions of rodent populations. So what was initially deemed to be, okay, we'll remove the cats because they're hurting our birds, et cetera. Then we had huge amounts of rats on the New Zealand islands. It's Little Barrier Island, a huge amounts of rats that all of a sudden turned up because the unintended consequence of that is that you're removing the rat's natural predator. So they were all eating the eggs and the bird populations continued to decline. In uh, its Marquis Island, um, it was rabbits. Uh, it turns out the birds were controlling the rabbit sorry the cats were controlling the rabbit population and all of a sudden you get this huge explosion of rabbits so really when we start messing around with those ecosystems we, we are not looking at the full picture we're, we're not seeing all of it and it's not our place to do so yeah it just i mean even if we take cats out of the equation if you remove one part of sort of that whole pyramid of you know environments and ecosystems you know, if you pull one piece of the puzzle out, the entire puzzle doesn't work. It, it collapses in some way, shape or form, whether you get, you know, ex an explosion of rats or rabbits, or you get, you know, other problems, you know, we as humans should not be messing around with mother nature's delicate balance because well, you, know, you, you, you start to get a piece that doesn't fit. And then you get some highly intelligent individual that feels the need to go ahead and take a hammer to that piece and try to get it to work again, you know, yeah, square peg, um, round hole kind of thing. 
yeah well yeah exactly just you know a three pound mallet isn't needed on a cardboard puzzle right so you know it's it's, controlling it's those populations does make sense and that's where tnr comes back in again when yeah. we talk about stabilizing populations and st stabilizing colonies and uh, obviously they're often referred to as colonies feral or community cat colonies um we when we look at tnr and how effective it can be the, the studies show these can they will stabilize so if you have an area that has 15 cats in it and we spay and neuter all those cats that then becomes their area you get very few new cats coming in and you tend to just stick with that 15 also and they've done studies on this on various university campuses where they've really been tracking these sort of things particularly around kind of uc gainesville uh, and up around that area which is kind of the, a bit of a hub for tnr and the research that's coming out right now and you can track these numbers and show that by by performing TNR, not only do we get healthier cats because we're vaccinating them, we're also deterring a lot of that behavior that people don't want, the, the fighting, the yowling, the spraying, um, and we're stabilizing that population as well. Um, therefore, we have a healthier group that's no longer breeding to the same extent. Cool. All right. So if you could build your dream job related to cats, what would it be? I like this question. I I am actually pretty passionate about what I do. Uh, I am really passionate about education around spay neuter. So I, I had to think about this for, for a while because you did, you did prompt me that I was going to be asked this. I had to really think about this. And I actually think it would be taking what we're trying to do here uh, and really uh, providing access to resources for people, for spay neuter, um, low cost veterinary care, and TNR, and then taking that worldwide, and really focusing on communities that don't have that access to resources or maybe that education. Um, you know, there's Spain into programs that that go on in in areas of South America or Asia, where vets and their teams will go out and you know build these pop-up spay neuter shelters and, and they're just kind of spaying and neutering everything that comes in and that to me is kind of the dream you know to take that level of, of caring and be able to provide those resources to people who can't and I just like the idea of traveling across the world doing it. <laughs> yeah, I feel like you could definitely be a global mogul for this kind of thing like just you know like I just you know we'll be like where's Megan oh she's in you know I don't know. Chile. Chile and you know she's helping cats down there in Brazil and just, you know she's hanging out with Rizzo Rat on an island Rizzo yeah. Rat. from the Muppets well you got to think about it you know why are all the rats coming to the island I mean Rizzo has made a very wow, clear you argument you have circled back I'm sorry we're gonna I'm gonna just no we're just I gonna... can see Megan going it's a lot of work to do here I'm gonna stay for a while <sighs> okay got it <laughs> trying to get me already fine <laughs> wow. all right well now that you've totally taken that over uh, what is the thing you love most about working in animal welfare? Um, I think all that kind of relates right back. I, I like being a part of the solution, or at least trying to be a part of a solution. And I know we can fix the world all at once and nobody can. We can't even fix the states all at once. But I like being a part of what's making things better. Um, and that's why I really like the education side of what we do as well. I really like, you know, being able to sit here and talk rubbish with you guys but also hopefully maybe somebody will learn something maybe they'll pass that on and I really like putting that out there and being a part of our solution to make our world better for animals and also better for the people who care for them you know I don't want anybody to have to be in a situation where they have an animal that they can't afford treatment for I want to be a part of that solution I want to be a part of helping somebody get their dog spayed you know or their their cat neutered because if they don't get him neutered and he doesn't stop spraying maybe they're going to surrender him I don't want him to be surrendered I want to be a part of that solution well and I think kind of coming at this from a foster perspective it helps people like us who just at times feel so overwhelmed by the amount of cats and kittens kittens especially that need foster homes and feeling like we just can't do enough. You know, even if we're in our case, you know, we've got two litters of kittens going at the same time and we're just cycling through cats and kittens. I'm still feeling like I see these emails of like, we need foster parents. Here are these kittens, you know, and just feeling like I wish I could do more. So by controlling or helping to mitigate 
the cats and kittens being born in these colonies or these kittens being born in these colonies, it also can help relieve some pressure on foster parents because then, you know, we could potentially just have one litter of kittens in our kitten room at a time and maybe take a break in between them during kitten season. But I know, I know, I, it's, I know, craziness. I know, what I know. What is this break you speak it's, of? It is a, it's a, it's a dream and I'm looking forward to it, but. I always thought your dream was like to have multiple kitten rooms. Like, like Andy, we're, we're down to half a room. I've no, taken over all of them. No, no, I really, I really like just the one room at the most. The kittens um, around here like confetti. But I, but I think that like, that would also be of benefit because you can you can have a, the same you could keep the same number of fosters but have fewer kittens that need fostering and then you know everybody kind of gets that decompression time and this is you know these are choices i make so i choose to to foster multiple litters in the, at the same time in the same room these are the choices i make but um but you know, to kind of be able to just be like, oh, okay, they don't really need me. That's awesome. That's the best solution to not be needed. Are these all your choices? I know some people have been very convincing. <laughs> what? <laughs> I mean, she, okay. So just, 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 just a heads up, everybody. Uh, Megan is the one who introduced marzipan into our lives. So uh, she is, she is, yeah. I mean, marzipan I is- but you guys made that choice. Oh no, it was, it's, it's a blessing, not a curse. Although she doesn't really care for me. She's much more fond of Andy, but. Yeah, at 4 a.m. Thank you, Daylight Savings Time. Awesome. So I think you guys are exactly right. Like seeing that from the other side, I was involved in foster for about four years and I want to try and make that better. I don't want that, that role to have to exist in the same way that it does that, that it's constantly critical. It's constantly, you know, you're getting babies from everywhere. Uh, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could get that to a point where things were more stable and then those kittens we talk about have maybe longer in a foster home or people don't have to take as many or we can foster out more adult cats who maybe need socialization or recovery time or, you know, th there's a lot of scope there if we were able to control these populations better and, you know, make things just a little softer on the shelters as well. I like, I like all of those variables. I like all of those things. I like helping colonies out in the outdoors. I like mitigating the number of um, kittens that are coming into shelters. Um, you know, the strain that it does put on a shelter and, and the volunteers within that shelter and the staff as well. Um, you know, so that it, it just, it benefits everybody in society and everybody in, you know, the cat communities. Um, it is a positive, it is a benefit. Um, so if you had one wish related to animal welfare, what would it be? And I think I know the answer to this question, but I'm going to let you share that with me. Ooh, do you? Okay. Okay. So I actually think I would like to see, and it's already kind of happening. I really want animal welfare and shelters, um, to become a resource in the community as opposed to a physical location where you get your animals. And I'm not saying that we're at that stage yet, but for me, it's really about um, being able to provide resources. We have to look at animal welfare, certainly from the perspective that I'm in, and obviously I'm in domestic pets. Um, I work predominantly with cats, but also heavily with dogs. And we have to look at these areas and say, okay, well, people are saying to us, they want to surrender their dog, why? And how can we say, what can we do to help you keep your dog? What can we provide for you? Is it issues with housing? Let us give you some housing options that maybe will allow you to keep your pit bull. Or can we write a letter to your landlord and explain things for them? Can we help you with pet deposits? Or is it issues with medical? Okay, let's provide you with access to medical resources. Let's give you low cost options for that. Like, what are your reasons for wanting to surrender? Because you got this pet. And for some reason you connect to this pet, this is your pet. I'm gonna bet you don't wanna surrender it. I'm gonna bet if we can find a solution to that, then things will be better for everybody. And we're seeing that start to happen. It's something that kind of is, is happening now across the US. We're getting more and more shelters that are becoming resources for their communities, not just the pound. Um, and they're becoming more and more involved in animal welfare in that sense. And that is my dream for animal welfare as a whole, that basically that, that 
pound mentality barely exists anymore and we're able to support people with their animals. Okay, totally through me because that's not what I thought you were going to say, but I loved that answer. That what was What do you think I was going to say? I kind of thought you were just going to keep going along the lines of, you know, I want the colonies to sort of be mitigated and the numbers to dwindle and, you know, from for my job to basically not be, you know, a necessity anymore, but your answer was way better. I loved that. That was so rad. Um, but speaking of, you know, local shelters and sort of that stigma that some, that sometimes can get attached to them, um, how can people help support their local shelters and what should they be aware of when adopting are, you know, are there shady shelters? How do you know what to look for? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, your local shelters, there's often several in your, in your community. Uh, they may be, you know, various different income types. Uh, they may be breed specific. They they may, you know, be small, huge. Uh, you know, we do 4,000 animals a year where I'm as a lot of animals. Um, so they really, really vary in size. I think the best way that you can support your local shelters is, is to engage with them. We're, we're in the age of social media as we talk on a podcast, obviously. Um, so engaging with them, even if you can't help, even if you can't donate or if you're unable to volunteer, share whatever they're putting out, like it, share it with your team. You never know. So if they're looking for a placement for a hard to place dog, share it. Who knows? Maybe somebody within your network will be interested in adopting that dog. And it, it may it may kind of put that those wheels in motion or maybe someone else's network. And I, you know, really when we're looking at that, it's kind of getting the word out and, and sharing that information and, and sharing those education points that they put out there as well. When you're talking about looking at legit shelters versus non-legit shelters, that's a little more complex. Uh, we do have kind of governing bodies, but they're not really. Um, so really you always wanna make sure that everyone has a 501c3 status, um, which is a nonprofit status, uh, whenever you're working with a small or large nonprofit organization. Um, and it is not adoption unless that animal is spayed or neutered. If that animal is not spayed or neutered, you are buying them. They are not being adopted. And um, so that is a big, big difference there. Um, always make sure you're looking into any medical records as well. Uh, make sure that they've they've done their due diligence and making sure they're up to date on their vaccines and all that sort of good stuff. And really don't ever feel pressured if you're going into an animal shelter. You know, nobody should be a salesman. You know, we're about making the right connections for people. Um, so if you're looking to adopt, you know, it's about making that connection. Don't ever feel pressured to walk out with a certain cat or a certain dog. It's about you connecting to that animal and that's really, really important. But really wherever you decide to go, so long as they're providing that welfare for the animals take a look at what they're living in you know are they providing enrichment and things like that that's you know we want to make sure we're supporting those places awesome that's awesome I like that those were really helpful answers because you know being able to kind of just have that information sort of tucked away at some point should you end up at a shelter or a sanctuary or something like that and you know realizing that these are the things to look for um you know that's that's really helpful and I like that sort of no one's trying to sell you anything that you know, that you should never feel pressured when it comes to bringing a member of, you know, bringing a family member into your home. You should never feel like, oh, well, you know, I got to take this cat well, because. Would, yeah. Well, that would also stop about probably 90% of the problems too, is that people go in, they're like, I'm going to adopt a dog today. And so they adopt a dog. That's the species that they want, but they don't actually participate in trying to make any sort of connection right I mean, and do your research about species as yeah. well because i mean i for example i love australian shepherds i think they're gorgeous so cute yeah could i have one no i'm far too lazy like they need far too much energy exercise and <laughs> they are a lot of work they are a lot yeah. of work yeah. they need a lot of running i i like to sit on the couch and snuggle so my lazy pit mix he's where I'm at, you know? <laughs> well, and you get, you, you get people that will go ahead and adopt a cat and, you know, both parties will go on in and one person, let's say, makes a connection, the other one, not so much. And next thing you know, somebody just opens up the back door and lets the cat go. Oh. You know, it's you know, things like this do cause that problem and people just don't put enough effort into trying to, I guess, establish a basis for caring for that animal. Yeah. You know, um, yeah got to be ready to go with it and it's, it's a whole family decision like you say you can't just have one person who wants an animal and, and another person who doesn't you know 
it's a whole family decision you've all got to be on board and, and you've all got to work together and want that animal to become a part of your household otherwise like you say it's not going to stick for whatever reason it won't stick and the last thing anyone wants is an animal to be returned to the shelter we never want this to be a trial period that's that's not the aim of this we don't want them to come back so if you're not sure don't adopt wait be sure this is a member of your family and I'm just going to say this because um, at this at the time of recording, we are getting closer to the holiday season. Um, please remember, ladies, and gentlemen, fellow listeners, cat enthusiasts, lovers of animals everywhere. Animals are not gifts. They are not presents. You don't put them under the tree. And then two weeks later, you return them because the batteries didn't work. Well, if you this put them under not... the tree and two weeks later, you finally open it up. Batteries aren't going to work. Andy, that was terrible. And <laughs> wow. Wow. I'm just saying. Wow. You went there. Yeah. But do not buy uh, or adopt an animal as a Christmas present. This is not a decision that one person makes for their entire home. Or if you're buying yours or not, I'm sorry, not buying. If you are adopting an animal for yourself and you live alone and you're like, hey, I'm going to get myself you know, a Christmas cat and we're going to hang out and be BFFs for the next 10, 15, 20 years of this cat's life. Cool. Cool. But do not get yourself a cat for Christmas and then expect family members to just be like, I'm on board with this. Right. This is this- your seven-year-old and expect them to take care of it fully and then be upset when they don't. Exactly. This is, this is a lifelong commitment. So this is not like, fun you know for two days after Christmas and then you know they move on to the next thing this is a lifelong commitment so I'm gonna get off my soapbox now and then I'm gonna ask you how people can help feral cat colonies and also prevent overpopulation which I think we sort of touched on how do we prevent overpopulation through TNR and TNVR but other than that is there a way that people can help feral cat communities yeah, so if you are aware that there are feral cats around you, I think the first thing to check for, like, like we kind of talked about, is are they ear tipped? So an ear tip is the universal sign of an outdoor altered cat. So this means that they have gone through the TNR process and that they no longer are able to make more babies. So if you're seeing cats outside and you notice that they, both their ears are intact, and when we talk about ear tip, it's a really, really small amount. So we take, uh, it's about a quarter of an inch right off the very, very tip of the ear. Um, and it's just that sign that basically if you were to bring that cat to my clinic, I'm going to go, no, thank you. Put it back where you found it because that one's already been altered. We don't want to repeatedly trap these cats. We don't want to repeatedly bring them into um, organizations or clinics. It's not helpful for anybody. Um, so that's that universal sign because most feral cats you're unable to, to kind of pick up and you know check see if they've got the uh, <laughs> So uh, we try and make it really, really straightforward to make sure that you can see that. So if they are un-ear tipped, um, I would definitely recommend connecting with your neighbors, making sure that they, you know, does anybody know about this cat? Does anybody know if it's somebody's cat? Does anybody know if it is, you know, anyone's feeding it? All that sort of good stuff. And once you've connected with your neighbors and you kind of get an answer to that, taking them in for TMVR is definitely your next step. So there's really great ways that you can find them. They, these clinics are all over the US. Um, we have clinics everywhere. They're all run by different organizations. Sometimes they're by nonprofits and sometimes they're for for-profit veterinarians. Um, a lot of veterinarians will provide TNR resources as well. And usually they're really inexpensive. We want to try and make this as little of a barrier as possible. Normally you're talking around 25 to 30 dollars so it's really not a lot to take these cats in connect with your local organizations and see what options are out there um alley cat allies is an amazing organization that um is yeah you know that one they're running across the um the us and they have a lot of resources on there as well so you can look a little more in depth or you can just google you know just google kind of who's offering those resources in your area if you need to trap you can also rent traps um most Shelters do have a trap bank they're referred to, and there's usually no fee for that. There's usually just a deposit to rent a trap, and they'll show you how to set it up. And there's also plenty of tutorials and all that sort of stuff. And you can go ahead and get those cats in, and that's going to stabilize that population. There's your first kind of answer to that. If they are ear tipped, find out if your neighbors are feeding them. Is anybody providing food for these? Do they have shelters? If you live in an area that gets really cold in the winter, has anybody provided any form of outdoor shelter? 
Now there's plenty of outdoor shelters that you can build really inexpensively um, and to just provide a, a safe, warm space for these cats. And we help them thrive in that way throughout the winter. Now here in Florida, as much as Bridget and Andy feel like it's cold here, it's not as much of an issue, but certainly in the North where it snows, um, we're wanting to make sure we have some some nice kind of warm spaces for those guys. And, and then if anybody's not feeding them, what can we do? Can we set up some feeding stations? Would we like to do that as a community? Gather your people together who care about these cats because you'll be surprised how many people actually notice these cats around. When we first moved not that long ago into the area that we're in now, um, this orange boy comes strolling up and go, okay, who are you? What are you doing here? <laughs> He's kind of one of the friendly community cats, you know, he, he lets us kind of touch him. We go, okay, you've definitely been to a clinic. We're good. We're, we're missing some parts there. That's good. And we asked around our neighborhood to see, you know, does anybody know him? Oh yeah, I feed him on a Wednesday. I do this. It's amazing how many people connect to these cats in your neighborhood. People often don't realize that. So knock on your neighbor's door, post it on next door, see who knows these animals in your area and see what we can do together to do the best for them. I like that. I like the reference to the next door app. I was going to mention that, that that's a great way to kind of connect with your neighbors, especially in this technological age. So for anybody who is unfamiliar, next door app is just sort of um, an app you can download onto your te- into your mobile device and connect with your neighbors sort of throughout your community, but in a less face-to-face way for those of us that don't always want to talk face-to-face to humans. Um, and for those of us that uh, don't necessarily have the time to go around, you know, knocking on doors. Um, so I loved the reference to the next door app. And then um, question about the ear tipping, because I know that to some people, and I've heard this before, you know, said people have said this to me that um, it doesn't it hurt the cats? Isn't it a really, you know, like horrible way to like maim them to let people know, like, can't you just trap them? Um, so can you kind of touch on the ear tipping thing and let people know what a little bit more about that? Sure. So ear tipping is done while they're under anesthesia, of course. This is done at the same time as they're spaying it up. So first one, they're not awake. They're not awake for this at all. It's not happening. We're not traumatizing them in that sense. And the nerve endings through there are really, really less sensitive than a lot of the other parts of the cat's body. So we're not looking at this being a, you know, a detriment to them in that sense. They really don't notice. Um, and it heals immediately. It's done with very, very sharp and kind of hot. Um, in a lot of cases, they'll cauterize it straight off. So it, it heals straight away. The chance of infection there is very, very slim. From a medical standpoint, it really works that way. But when we talk about what's more detrimental to the cats, and especially if we're talking about true ferals, and by true ferals, I mean outdoor cats that do not want to be touched. They don't want to be around people. They're going to run if they see you. If we trap these cats multiple times, bring them into a shelter setting or a clinic setting multiple times, the chances of them getting sick through stress the chances of them being more terrified of what they've already, of people and of traps, um, of, you know, an area, they may run away from that. It's far more detrimental to repeatedly trap the same cat and take him into a a clinic than it is for us to mark him in some way. And when we look at that as being a universal marker, you know, you may notice your pet cat has a small tattoo on the inside of them. A lot of shelters will do that. It's a little, yeah, Marty Pam will have one. It's a little uh, kind of green line mm-hmm. and it's right around their spay or neuter site. So if you have a pet cat and say that cat gets out and we end up with it in a shelter environment, we'll check to see if they have that to see if they are spayed or neutered. I don't want to try and do that to a feral cat. No. I don't want no. to have to up and kind of see what's going on there there's there's far too much you know risk and stress involved with that as well so we we really needed to find a way that is a a visible marker to ensure that these cats aren't repeatedly trapped and brought into shelter i mean it is easier to kind of tell if 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 the boys have been altered than than the girls because you know most of the time you can kind of just look and be like oh no you're you're good um especially if they're not ear tipped but uh but it is definitely harder with the females. So um, I think I see my boy behind you. Um, oh, that's Wanda. That's, that's my girl. Oh, baby girl. Um, which uh, actually leads right on into one of our last questions, which we have asked everybody on this show. Are there any cats at your current residence? If so, what are their names? And do they want to be on camera? 
<laughs> I'm amazed that she's saying yes to this because normally she's kind of hiding in the background. So I'm going to tilt you guys down a little bit. This is Wanda. So she is my blind baby. Uh, she is a shelter cat and she was born blind. She is microphthalmic, which means her, both her eyes are far, far smaller than what they should be. So she isn't visual, um, and, but she's completely used to her life being that way. Um, shout out to HIHS, Hawaii Island Humane Society. That's where she came from um, and they saved her and uh, they're an amazing organization. So if you're out in the islands, go visit them. They're fantastic. Uh, so this is Wonder, and then I like to theme my name. So I also have Jagger. He is my rolling stone. He is a CH boy and uh, he has cerebellar hyperplasia, uh, which is also known as wobbly cat syndrome or uh, drunken sailor syndrome. He's a moderate kid know and um, so he walks and moves around but he can't jump he can't really run um he weeble wobbles over a little more than his usual and then i have my only true foster fail and uh, her name is hendrix uh, i had her when she was two days old and her mom did not have enough milk she was just a, a baby herself so she became a bottle baby and we hand reared her and i guess i'm a bit of a sucker and i couldn't let her go uh, she's totally able-bodied and uh, an absolute nightmare for the most part but i i don't know where any of the rest of them other than my wonder have gone <laughs> jagger is i'm just gonna say this jagger is my favorite you know this but for the fans listening jagger is my favorite i love him he is my sweet boy every time i go to visit he's just like snuggly man love him um but um hendrix is a re another really great example of why the tnr tnvr programs are so are so important you know you've got babies having babies out there on the streets and you know i've had this situation before where we've had moms that just cannot produce enough milk they are young they are stressed they are sick and they have babies and it's just tough life out there it is and bottle feeding kittens is is a commitment being a bottle baby foster like i give every one of them mad props because that is a dedication of time that i just cannot give to cats and i'm always you i mean you know i was like i can't take this cat you got to do something else with it find somebody else please um but it just was gonna be real honest about hendrix you know um she was one of the litter of four and she was the only one that made it and I was her her foster and I'd like to think I know some skills by this point um even with the best care you can give bottle feeding is not an ideal solution not only is it a commitment it, we're also not able to give them what a mom would be able to give them in terms of nutrients we're not able to mimic that we're not there um so it's not as easy as just finding some bottle babies scooping them up and taking them to the shelter and they're going to be fine that's not the reality of what we're looking at here. Um, the euthanasia, sorry, not euthanasia rate, the death rate is is still pretty high. Uh, mortality rate, should I say, is still pretty high in those, despite people feeding every two hours round the clock for weeks. Uh, so yeah. it just isn't, isn't what we'd like it to be. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's definitely, you know, between, between us, you know, just the two of us here, I know, just as a personal foster, like just removing you as, you know, as the, from the staff side, just as a, as a foster parent, I know you've had loss, we've had loss. Um, it, it, you know, it, it is a hard job being a foster parent and I don't want to scare people away because it's so important and it is so rewarding. It is so, so, so rewarding to be a foster parent. Um, but it is the reality of having overpopulations you know, overpopulation of, of cats in, in our country and in our world and not finding a solution to that and continuing to, you know, require all of these, these resources to keep these cats alive, which is important, but also just, you know, trying to lessen that, that strain and, and those, you know, those numbers. And as you talk about overpopulation, again, it all kind of comes back together because we're talking about these mom cats that may come into our shelters with their babies and they are themselves, they're emaciated. The competition for resources is too high. They're not able to get enough food. So straight from the bat, because you have a high overpopulation, 
you're seeing cats that aren't able to, to eat enough to find enough food. So they're already skinny. They're not able to provide enough milk for their babies. In addition, we see explosions of viruses in the certain areas as well. So we'll see that for a certain time, we'll get a large amount of herpes virus coming from the same group or area of cats and kittens as they're coming in, which can be fatal to kittens. And we say, well, how do we solve this? Well, we spay them so they don't have to have any more and then we vaccinate them and we stop that that spread of disease as well. So again, you're controlling that population and it all just relates straight back again. It all comes straight back to controlling those populations through TMBR and, and stopping that at the source to try and make it easier on our foster parents and try and make those cases a little less. A little less. So we won't keep you much longer. We just have one more question for you and then we'll let you enjoy your time with you know, your family, I know your family's in town, so it's very exciting and uh, just kind of enjoy your time off away from, you know, work and get to decompress a little. But before we do that, um, is there anything we haven't discussed that you would like to share with our listeners that you feel that they should, that they should hear that's important to what's going on in our world? Absolutely. So we've talked a lot about shelters and we've talked a lot about different shelters uh, and what they do. And there's one thing that I, like to try and educate people on when I get the opportunity and hopefully your, your listeners are, are interested in this sort of thing um, is the term no kill so many of us have heard that term kind of around when we talk about shelters and it re refers to a shelter that does not euthanize for time or space that's the definition of it they have to be at 90 percent safe rate so that's the definition of what being a no kill shelter and a lot of people you'll hear say well i only want to support no kill shelters i only want to give my money to no kill shelters because the other shelters they're euthanizing animals it's this idea that it permeated coming from the right place it came from the right area um it's the right idea of course we all want to be no kill none of us want to euthanize for time or space it's not why we're in animal welfare but there's a difference in how it can be executed so usually when we look at what are no-kill shelters, they are shelters that are managed or closed intake. This means you have to have an appointment to take your animal there. And if you find a stray, that's not where it goes. When we look at our shelters that do not make the no-till classification, they're often the shelters that have a municipal contract, so they're controlled by the government, or they have animal control involved in them in some ways. And they may have officers that are picking up. So if you were to find a stray, that's where it would go. The huge difference here is what we talk about with the number of in and out. Any shelter only has a set amount of space. So a shelter may have 50 dog kennels, let's say, and they may adopt out five dogs a day. Dogs are just an easier number for me to work with in terms of physical space. So excuse my dog language, but this works for cats as well. Um, so they may have 50 dog kennels and they adopt out fifth, uh, five dogs a day. So a closed or limited admissions uh, shelter We'll say, okay, we take in five dogs a day and they run right at that line. You know, they're able to adopt out and take in the same amount. A open admission shelter, which is often a no kill, are uh, not no kill shelters. They don't make that. They don't have any control over how many animals are coming in each day. So they may adopt out five dogs, but 15 may come in and they have to find ways to be creative. They have to find foster parents. They have to find, they, they'll often have your adoption specials. They'll, you know, be do, trying to encourage you to adopt more. They'll be in local areas. My main point about all of this is obviously it's incredibly sad when any shelter has to make that decision. Mm. And all those shelters deserve our support. The only way that a shelter that does not currently make no kill status get to no kill status is our community support be it sharing their things on social media be it giving them money adopting from them talking positively about them let's not refer to people as dog catchers or the pound let's talk about them in a positive light these people are there doing heartbreaking work every single day and some of those animals don't make it out and that is the hardest environment for anyone to be in because they fall in love with these animals too so that's kind of my, my soapbox that I will stand on for today is that whether we are a no-kill shelter or a kill shelter, we are all doing the same wonderful work and we all deserve our community support. Oh, don't you make me emotional. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know I'm a big giant softy. You know that I'm, I'm, the, I'm the weepy one of the relationship. You know, got Spock over here. He's fine. Yeah, I'm just fine. Um, it's the reality of it. Um, so I loved that. That was 
thank you because I feel like so often there are, you know, positive and negative connotations associated with these, these words. Um, and it's, it's nice and refreshing to kind of hear all of them being put together as good places and just being given an explanation of what those terms mean exactly in from within the industry, you know, looking at it from the outside, you know, yeah, I hear the word no kill, the words no kill shelter. And I'm like, yes, this is what, this is important. This is, we should be talking about these things. Why are we not, you know, supporting these places more? Um, but it, you know, it does, it does help to have that perspective of just because they don't say no kill doesn't mean that they're not dedicating everything and all of their resources to these animals. It's not like, you know, this place is a dump. It's, it's a legitimate shelter and they're doing everything they can. They just don't have the ability to be able to say, I'm sorry, we can't take these animals. Exactly that. Exactly that. If you run a business or if you've ever worked anywhere, if you've worked in hospitality, can you imagine not being able to say, I'm sorry, we don't have any tables tonight or all our hotel rooms are full. They don't have that option. They have to take every animal that comes to that door. And that's that's so hard. And, and knowing so many people who have worked in both, I can tell you that those people are some of the the most giving and you know, they're working 12 hour days to try and save these animals and and they have probably far too many foster animals in their homes to try you know their best to, to stop that outcome so yeah I, in my soapbox is I really want to stop that that demonization of this idea that there's a difference between us or that one is better than the other one just has different resources one just has different limits than the other but we all need to work together that's the only way we ever get out of this is that all our shelters need to support each other and our community needs to support all our shelters. I loved everything you just said, all of those things. I'm, and I want to live in that world, that in the world where cats take over the world. I want to live both. Of the, I want to live in both of those worlds. I want to, you know, go back to the cats taking over the world. And then I also want to live in the world where the shelters are working together and we are supporting them as, as community members. I yeah. like all of these things. I don't know. Both I, scenarios work for me. I'm think, good. I think getting home from the grocery store and grabbing your grocery bags and then having some bobcat run along and steal <laughs> them from you is not a world I want to live in. I would poop. I would probably poop if a bobcat ran into my house and stole my grocery bags. You know, I'd be like, and I'm done. You know, army of bobcats at our front garage. No, like, no, I'm hey good. Man. Like here, you we, have you have what you need. I have. Your, we see you're back from the grocery store. There, what you got? I'd be like, I have nothing for you. It's all vegan meat. It I, will do you no good. To buy like a decoy bag now. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, um, we are going to let our friend go, spend time with her family, and enjoy her day. Thank you so 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 much for all of your time. This was so much fun. I mean, you and I can have fun just sitting around doing absolutely nothing and talking about you know like the weirdest things, but this was delightful. Thank you so much for your time. I, um, I cannot wait for our listeners to kind of get through this and to be able to get a different perspective. And, you know, we've been doing a lot of tiger talk, but it's really awesome to finally be able to have a conversation about domestic cats as well. So, um, thank you so much. Appreciate you. Um, we will see you again soon. Um, but, uh, have a great day and, um, thanks again. Appreciate you being here with us. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. All right. So um, Marzipan has actually decided she's going to join us for this last tiny bit. You can probably hear her. And for those of you that are also watching, you can see her little tiny-ish face. Oops. You're not supposed to eat the mic. Oh, oh man. My goodness. See, we, we invite cats to come into our little studio here, and this is what happens. She's special. She's a cute girl. So you guys met Megan. Megan is awesome and has a lot going on. Holy smokes, she has a lot going on. I know. And to uh, be honest, without Megan, there would be no marzipan. So I feel like it's it's very fitting for Meg, to Mar, for marzipan to have been like, I'm going to hang out with you guys for this part because uh, she is... Uh, Futsy? She's, she's trying to... She's Ugh. like, Dad... There. situate me there you go um so yeah i think it's just perfectly fine that she's here with you because she just she's the best girl so but um <laughs> but thank you guys so much for joining us 
on this cat on this cat chat. Um, we are grateful for you guys to have stayed with us throughout this uh, throughout this podcast and learned things about domestic cats that you may not have known or potentially may have known. Um, but it's uh, it's always a fun time meeting new people and getting to know um, who they are and listening to the stories that they have to tell and also um, just being able to kind of hi <laughs> being able to kind of um, get a different perspective and hear things that you may not have known and and like I said I continue to learn things about the cat world things that may not have ever crossed my mind in the past so um, we yeah. hope that you enjoyed this and uh, we hope that you're enjoying Mars Pan right now because <laughs> she's definitely even though she's a daddy's girl she's kind of settling right in here with uh, yeah. me now yeah you know I thought it was interesting with uh, with Megan's I never really thought about the whole no kill shelter you know dynamic um and the issues that they do have there um and then uh you know why people think the way they do about those certain things it's uh i've run into that a couple times where people will message me because they know that i volunteer or i foster with our local shelter um or that they know that i am with you know i'm a foster mom because we have we have our own our, our own facebook page um but uh it's it's really interesting to think you know that I've had people reach out to me and they and then them say to me well I don't want to surrender this animal to such and such place because they're not a no kill shelter and I you know I never really kind of knew how to respond to that other than to say to them well they may not be labeled as a no kill shelter but they will do everything they can to help this animal yeah um you're taking this cat or this dog to a good place well it's not like shelters that aren't no kill shelters are going out of their way to kill the animal you know it's just it's a different way of doing things and sometimes you just kind of end up going that direction uh but yeah it was great interview awesome interview um and uh yeah i think that's uh (laughs) the exception of bridget getting attacked by marzipan here um you know if you are going to continue this we're not going to let you be a part of the podcasts anymore do you have anything else no thank you guys so much for listening or watching we appreciate your support um as always stay tuned for another episode of cat chat with bridget and andy um we'll be back again in a month we'll see you guys then and hope you have a great day um make it great and don't forget to just keep loving on the cats big small no matter well don't physically love on the big cats but you know from afar from a safe distance donations will help (laughs) (laughs) And uh, support your local cat communities, whether that's just, you know, being an advocate, um, an advocate, an advocate for um, for them, you know, or sharing this this information with people you meet who may have, you know, a, a different opinion than you do. And, and that's not saying it's a wrong opinion. It's just maybe they just have misinformation. So this is a, I think this is a great resource for any, anybody you run into who may be like, oh, feral cat communities are horrible. Um, because without actually getting the information, you don't know until you know. And that's something that we've all experienced at Big Cat Rescue and uh, other places in our lives. Yeah. More info the better. All right, gang. You guys have a great one. We will talk to you guys soon. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye.